Praise the Lord. It is good to be uh, together with my brothers and sisters. And um, thank you, Rick. And um, thank you, brother. I'm, I'm overjoyed to be here. I've been with you in spirit over the past sessions that you've had. I've been getting the reports and um, I had some pre-existing um, appointments that uh, I had to attend to. Um, but wanted to be here this evening, and um, isn't it great when the Lord is in your midst and you sense the presence of God and people who are just yielded to the Holy Spirit? So, um, special thanks and recognition to Harold and his uh, visionary leadership for calling us together. I believe it was when we were in Jerusalem in June, I think, um, that this this sense of the need for a prophetic prayer gathering around this key season, a a time that's often hidden. You know, it's interesting. There there may be one or two of you here tonight. We see a lot of our our Eagles Wings family here tonight. There may be one or two of you who were here years ago when we were at the theater um, in Flushing Meadows, Queens, and we did the very first Celebrate Israel concert, which I had completely forgotten about. Until last night, the event that I had to do last night, this, this Jewish individual came up to me and said, I was there. You know, and I didn't even remember that event. It was the first Celebrate Israel that we did. David Nekrutman was still an administrative assistant to an assistant to an assistant at the, at the consulate. And, um, but the reason I say that is when you drive by that building... People don't even know that that's actually the building, not today's United Nations, but that's actually the building where on November 29th, this was signed. And so many times the most important truths are things that are hidden. And so it's, it's fine to, to, to come together and to recognize what other people might be missing. And God gave Harold that strategy and that burden and that insight, and we're very, very grateful. When I, when I grew up, there was a, a board game called Risk. Does anybody remember Risk? And it was how you would plot to take over the nations, right, through Risk, and, and all the pieces on the board of Risk. And when I think of Harold, I think of the game of Risk, because Harold is kind of the general of Europe. I mean, he's, just, he's in charge of everything over there. And we thank the Lord for your faithfulness and for your humility and for your perseverance in the kingdom of the Lord. And we honor your leadership here and for gathering us together. And Rick and Patty, it's always a joy to be with Rick and Patty. We met in January 1993 on, on a mountaintop in Jerusalem at that hotel. And we were there with Derek Prince and Lance Lambert and Johannes Fossius and and some of those wonderful generals who prepared the way. And, uh, and we met that first time. And you were still, I think, in Belgium at the time before you came. And you were in Philadelphia for a season and with us in New Jersey for a season and many trips to Buffalo. And then the, the relocation to Jerusalem. And how Rick and Patty through Sukkot Hillel have raised a banner for the nations and really have, have rallied the nations uh, into alignment with prayer and intercession, and now through the Alav Conference for the, uh, the Messianic youth, the Christian youth, the Arab youth, uh, bringing all of them together, the Palestinian youth, bringing them all together. Um, it's fantastic, and it's a joy to be here and hear you again. Patty, I was remembering <clears throat> you were leading worship one Sunday at Narky Street Baptist Church, and um, you had that, so you just written the song... Um, Spirit, Holy Wind of God. We Remember that one? And I, I still will hum that song and remember that song. All, yeah, absolutely. So we appreciate Rick and Patty so very, very dearly. And I want to thank um, some of my staff. I want to thank Rosalind and Dina who've been serving. Rosalind has been for several weeks serving this event. Thank you, Ros. I said, Roz, I think it's just going to be a labor of love. I said, I have just got you. I'm going to throw you in. And she said, absolutely. And Roz, thank you so much for all that you've done. Roz is amazing. She's, she's tested in the fire. She's put up with me for 15 years. So, I mean, she's got to be special. 
And it's one, I don't want to go around, but I just want to honor all of our friends and so many folks that I wish we saw more of and, and had more time with. But we love you and bless you all, the Daguerre's and Brother Madero and all of you in the back. And, and really so honored to have one of the great apostolic families of the UK, the Urquhart family. And Jane, it's just an honor to have you here tonight. We honor you and Clive and your, your in-laws and... and and all of the all of the work that you've done in the UK, and and um, what a joy to see you here tonight. And thank you for coming coming across the pond, and 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 being here with us. It's it's wonderful. I've been struggling the past few weeks with some um, vocal problems. Could I ask you to help me and just bring the treble, bring the bass down a tiny bit, and give me a tiny bit more volume, just a little less bass and a tiny bit more volume, and then hopefully won't get feedback and we'll be okay. That's, that's much better. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate it. Um, so Harold uh, texted me this afternoon, and he said, I'd like you to share for about three hours tonight. And I said, yes, sir. No problem, whatever you say. Three to four hours. That's right. That's right. Um, but I, I just like to, you know, it's a very interesting journey that we're all in when we accept the fact of what Harold was sharing earlier, that we are living in a unique moment in history. And when you really begin to frame your reality around that, when you really begin to choose to live as a member of the tribe of Issachar, of one who understands the times and and knows what God is doing, everything kind of becomes, hello, Jody, God bless you, New York intercessors. Where would we be without New York intercessors? Thank you, Jody, for all that you do. Um, Everything starts to change because the rest of the world is kind of living on one timeline and living on one reality. And you're kind of getting instructions from a whole other place. You're, you're, you're kind of marching to a different, a different drumbeat and, and, and you're, you're not, you don't, you know, you're in the world, but not of it. And, um, and so there's all kinds of emotional and psychological realities that come along with that. You, you have to, you know, I thought Patty was so, it was so interesting, Patty, you know, there's little, you get the little whispers from the Holy Spirit, you know. And today I was, I was just walking down after my one meeting, going back to the hotel to come here, and I was walking by this uh, window, and I just went in, it was an antique store, and there was a, a can, set of candles that I was looking at, and da, da, da. Next to that, there was this really unusual ring. And I asked the storekeeper, I said, this is just, it was a very strange, it, I don't know how to describe it, it was a very unusual looking ring. And I said, what is this? What is this all about? And he said, oh, that is, and I don't remember the term he used, it's some type of an antique term where they would stamp something or uh, kind of a signet ring, a seal. It was, you know, that thing, there was a certain term he used. But I said, well, what, what is the seal? And he said, oh, that's such and such with an anchor. He said, that's the anchor of hope. And that was this afternoon as I was walking down. And then Patty began to sing out this whole kind of song, right? About the anchor of hope. And, and um, so, you know, you start to believe that little things like that actually, <laughs> actually come from another place. And then you have to, to navigate what that means to, to live in two realities. And then to believe that your call is to bring those realities together. Let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so you live in the tension in between these two realities. Jack Hayford, uh, Jack Hayford calls it, he says, Christians should be people of the horizon. When you look far into the horizon, you can't see where the land ends and the heaven begins. And And that's where we need to live. We need to live in that very interesting place where we are by our very lives and our words and our actions calling those things that are not as though they were and, and bringing forth a new reality. So um, we're here commemorating and recognizing this historic vote that brought earthly legitimacy to a heavenly covenant, uh, brought the, the earthly permission to that which God had already ordained, And really, we can look at that as a place where there was finally agreement uh, because we are able to say definitively that the the, the nations came into agreement with this 
recreation of the state of Israel. And it gives, for those who do not share our worldview, for those who do not share our background, it, it gives us a place to stand firmly on the side of the rule of law and international justice as we defend Israel's cause in that. But I want to go back before that, and I want to kind of go to two places today. I, I want to talk for a moment. Many of us know the name Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl was the founder of modern Zionism. He was the one, he was actually a reporter. He was a journalist living in Vienna. And he covered the famous Dreyfus trial where uh, a man was convicted um, wrongly and there was anti-Semitism happening in the midst of the trial. And, and Herzl came to believe that there never would be, there never would be peace for the Jewish people as long as they lived in the midst of the nations. He came to believe as a secular Jew that it was absolutely necessary that there be some place where Jews could live as Jews. And he began to call for this uh, regathering of the, of the Jewish people. And he wrote uh, a book that called for the creation of the state of Israel. And everyone, if, if you know Israel, if you know that history, everyone knows the story of Herzl. What very few know the story of, who very, very few know the story of Herzl's friend, who was William Heckler. And William Heckler was an evangelical, spirit-filled pastor. He was a chaplain. He was quite a character. He had a long, Abrahamic beard, and you would go to his apartment, and his entire apartment, floor to ceiling, was books and maps. And he had worked out, I thought of it tonight, Harold, as you went through the dates, he had worked out through prophetic history that he believed that the state of Israel, the Jewish people, would come home and begin in, he worked it out to the very year, and I believe the year was 1897. I have a book that says it definitively. Well, amazingly, in retrospect, he was accurate in the sense that the First World Zionist Congress that Herzl called in Basel, Switzerland, happened in the year that he had gotten prophetically going all the way back to the Babylonian exile. It was absolutely fascinating. And Heckler shows up at Herzl's door one day and knocks on his door and he says, you don't know me, but I've been waiting for you. God has called you. God has appointed you. And I'm here to help you in your mission in the calling home of the Jewish people. Well, Heckler happened to be the tutor, the, um, the tutor, teacher, to the children of Kaiser Wilhelm. Which, interestingly... They were, at that time, in Karlsruhe, which is where our dear friends, the Mullers, are. We've been together at the church in Karlsruhe. I never knew that till the other day. And Heckler and Herzl would, Herzl came to meet with the Kaiser in Karlsruhe. We've been there together at, 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 at Missionswerk. Yeah. And uh, this amazing journey unfolds between a seeing, hearing believer and a secular, unbelieving Jew who together are marching forward into the purposes of God. And I often think to myself, you know, what was in Heckler's mind when he was dealing with this unbelieving, stubborn Jew who didn't believe in God, really, who kind of thought Heckler was a little nuts, yeah, Heckler would have been right at home here and Herzl would have been, you know, out of his element. And yet these two are journeying together and history changed because of this remarkable partnership and between them forming a functional friendship that the purposes of God were carried out on. If we are going to partner with God in history, we have to be willing to go into places and situations and 
and things that are outside of what our comfort zone is. And we have to recognize, as Rick prophesied tonight, that, that he is king of the nations, not just king of the church. He's moving everywhere. And if we come with a very limited religious perspective, we will perhaps cut off the very thing God is doing and wanting to release. I'm convinced that we are on the verge, and I'm convinced of it prophetically, but I also have some literal knowledge. We're on the verge of seeing some massive positive changes. Harold has just referred to this situation in Africa where in a day we could see major change in the United Nations. We, we could see all kinds of things quickly shifting. We're, we're seeing for the first time Saudi Arabia because of their fear of Iran, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia is saying, if I've got to choose between the Ayatollahs and Netanyahu, I'll quietly choose Netanyahu. I might not bring him home to dinner, but I'm going to cooperate. What are we looking at? Unlikely alliances. God moving in history in ways that we wouldn't expect. I got a phone call about four months ago. And... The individual said, the, the foreign minister, we're taping this, so I won't say the nation, but the foreign minister of such and such a nation is coming and they, they would like you to arrange, they want to meet evangelical pastors. They've heard of evangelical pastors. This is, I will say, it, it's, a, it's a Muslim nation. It's one of the 57 world's Muslim nations. The foreign minister is coming to the GA at the UN and they would like to meet evangelical pastors. And they said, could you pull together 20 of them to meet with the foreign minister for breakfast? And so three days later, I said, sure. And we, we pulled together this breakfast with about 20 pastors. Well, four weeks ago, three weeks ago, I got a letter from the ruler of this nation. And they said, I've received such an amazing report from our foreign minister. And he said, we have determined as a, and this is, he put this in the letter, we have determined as a Muslim nation to be open to all peoples and tolerant of all faiths. I, would you come as my guest? I'd like to fly you to the palace for three days and have you spend three days meeting with the sheikhs of my nation, the imams, and teach them about evangelicalism. He said, I know that we have 300,000 evangelicals in our nation and we want to be open and tolerant. Would you help us understand this and would you help us move forward in this? And so that's what I'm doing in a couple weeks. God is moving and shifting and doing things quickly behind the scenes. And I believe, I believe we're living in days of extraordinary importance. There are three primary themes that I that I sense, and they I, I we all see in part, we know in part. I am not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet. I direct a non-profit organization, so I you know I. But three themes that um, that I'd like to point us toward, and one of them I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because I know you already know this one. The first is we're living in the day of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. That is, that is the moment that we are in. Um, some of you know the uh, revelatory experience that I had about 12 years ago when I was taken to another place and definitively the angel of the Lord told me that the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled and that God had shifted his, his heart and his plumb line and his direction toward Jerusalem. And that we were to align ourselves moving forward according to Jerusalem. So I, I, I know definitively because I had a 
experience that was not a dream, was not a vision, was a, I was taken somewhere and, and shown this. And so we're, we're living in this moment where 2,000 years of syncretistic Greco-Roman Christianity, which is mixture, uh, it has, is, is dying. And the true Judeo-Christian thing is rising in, in this time. Last night, the reason I was not able to be here, I was with about 50 of the leading, um, the Jewish leaders of New York City in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting. And the Orthodox, this is amazing, the Orthodox rabbi from Yeshiva University, who get this, his specialty, he teaches master's level class on um, how will we know the Messiah when he appears. His specialty is the Messiah. And I said, boy, are we going to be good friends? I said, I said, we have a lot to talk about. And we just went right for it. And he, 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 he has a lecture. This was amazing. I have to watch it. He's got a lecture on YouTube. The prophetic sense of smell that the Messiah will have. And from scripture, there are certain aspects. that It was just fascinating. He's made his whole life's work. And I said, I said, well, what do you do with Isaiah 53? And he said, we're going to have to have a talk about that. I said, yes, we are. But here's what he said to me last night. This is the Orthodox professor at Yeshiva University. He said, he said, all I can explain to you is this. He said, I feel more affinity and connectedness and, and, and spiritual togetherness with you and with Christians like you than I do with most of the ultra-liberal Jewish community in this nation that doesn't have any sense of connection to Jerusalem or the Temple Mount, etc. Now, and I, I want to say this lovingly, I feel more a sense of connection to him than a lot of Sunday morning churches I'll go into across this nation right now. So something is emerging. Maybe it's the one new man. Maybe we're walking toward that new thing that God is bringing that's pretty much going to mess with all of our theology. Don't you love it that God gets to be right and we don't? So, <clears throat> I just I, I said this last night to him, and I just like it. I, I haven't figured out if it's true yet, but I, I hope it's true because I really like it. I said to him last night, I said, theology without mystery is idolatry. I hope that's true because I really want to be quoted as saying that because it just sounds good. We need to leave room for mystery. We need to leave room for God to be God, not our theology to be God. Because frankly, this whole book, cover to cover, is God blowing up people's theologies. It's Peter going up on a rooftop in Joppa and having a dream and everything changing. So we've got to be those who have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Holy Spirit is saying. So, three things. Number one, I believe, and I think we all understand this, this moment of the restoration of David's tabernacle. The, the, the traditional church, if it is not rooted and grounded in connection to Jerusalem and an understanding of Jesus the Jew and our grafted inness to the covenant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if they don't walk in that revelation, they will go the way of the apostasy that we're seeing right now. They will go that way. They may last for 10 minutes, but it will, it will be gone. But something glorious is going to emerge in the midst of that. The second thing that I would like to go to is Isaiah chapter 2. And I, um, the Lord led me to Isaiah 2 at the beginning of, we're really right around Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and I've been living in Isaiah 2 ever since. I think Rick and Patty, I might have mentioned this to us at the day of prayer, I'm not sure. But this is what Isaiah sees. He says, verse 2 of chapter 2, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. 
It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. All nations will stream to it. Now, I don't believe that this is speaking of a physical raising of the mountain. I believe what this is speaking of is, at least in part, a a rising up of the preeminence of Jerusalem and specifically Har Habayat, the Temple Mount, the, the Hill of the Lord, an awareness that this is the mountain of all mountains. So I believe this is talking about a growing awareness that there is a geographic center to the spiritual universe. There is a geographical center to the spiritual universe. And we're living in the moment that that mountain is being raised. We can look back to the year 2000 when Ehud Barach and Yasser Arafat were at Camp David. And I have friends who are in those meetings. And Arafat was offered everything they could have possibly ever wanted. And for the tiny percent Exactly that, that they were not offered. They offered massive financial differences. And what did it come down to? It really came down to the issue of the Temple Mount. It came down to the issue of the Temple Mount. And so this issue of the mountain of the Lord. So Isaiah sees this. He says, there's coming a day the mountain will be established. as chief. It's going to be raised. I believe we're living in the day of the raising up of God's mountain. All nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And the Jewish people, for the, we are provoking them to jealousy because we are going up and sometimes care more about the things they should be caring about than they do, which causes them to remember who they are. The Jewish people come into our worship services and they're overwhelmed. And I say, we stole all this from you. This is all, (laughs) this is all the Psalms. This is all every, the dancing, the shouting, the clapping, the tambourines. It's all yours. And we're calling forth that dormant Levitic anointing that God has ingrained upon them. He will teach us his ways that we may walk in his path. The law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we're coming to a moment where humanity has thrown billions upon billions, probably trillions of dollars at world peace. Right, Margot? Margot, Margot's career was at the UN. Right? Right? Billions and trillions, the finest minds in the world have gathered together. Has world peace come from New York? Has world peace come from Brussels? Has world peace come from the tree huggers of Hollywood who are going to, you know, tell us how to... No. Could it be that it's time for another city to arise? A city of God's government. A city of shalom. And that we begin to see that God's peace process is released when hearts are changed. Take care of hearts and boundaries and borders will take care of themselves. And when we begin to see hearts changed, the Holy Spirit is released in an incredible way. Let me tell you just a story about this because it's amazing. It's going to be one of those stories that isn't going to sound as good as if you were there. So even though I'm starting to tell it, I'm thinking, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because it's a good story. You had to be there, but it was a great story. So we have one of our guides in Jerusalem. His name is Aviad. He's amazing. He's incredible. And he is a strong, righteous Jew. I mean, he prays three times a day. He honors Shabbat. He knows the word of God inside out. He knows the New Testament in Greek. You know, I mean, he, he knows the Bible. Lives in the, uh, lives in Judea, Samaria area there. And um, so we're over there 
and we, one of our trips not long ago, I brought 30 pastors with me, 30 young millennial evangelical pastors. And the whole trip, Aviad is guiding us and leading us. And he must have referred 20 times to Zechariah 8, the rich prophetic chapter that talks all about the children playing in the streets of Jerusalem and this and that. And he's quoting it from memory, this and on and back and forth, Zechariah 8 and on and on and on. We get to the end of the trip. And he brings us up on the Mount of Olives overlooking the old city. And he kind of gives a recap of the whole trip. He gives a recap of the entire time that we had together. And then I said, and we had people on the trip from Brazil. We had people from uh, Nigeria. We had people from all around the world. Pastors. And I said, Avia, let's just get you into the middle. And I turned to the scripture in Zechariah 8 that says... In that day, ten men from the nations will take hold of, take firm hold of the, of the lapel of a Jew and say to you, let us go with you because we have heard that your God is with you. And so Aviad, who has been guiding us, quoting Zechariah 8 almost every day, is there. I say, Aviad, just come stand in the middle. And he, we gather around him, and I, I, I get out my, my iPhone, and I, I read, I say, and ten Gentiles, ten men from the nations will take firm hold of the Jew. And Avia, now he wouldn't have language for this, but the Holy Ghost came upon him. And he began to just shudder. And he said, he said, where are you reading from? He said, he said, where, is that in the New Testament? He said, where are you reading from? I said, Aviad, it's Zechariah 8. It's not Zechariah 8. I said, Aviad, it's what you've been quoting all week long. He says, I've never, no. And I show him the Bible. I say, I say, Aviad, it's right here. And it was like he'd been blind to it. He'd, he could quote, the, but he'd never seen it. Never, and he said, all of a sudden, I'm living it. That's the moment we're in. We're in a moment where prophetic things are pressing in on us. And those representatives at the UN never had a clue fully what they were doing, but they were stepping into a prophetic word that was thousands of years old. And God said, now is the time for that kairos to be activated. I've somehow become dear, dear friends with the Orthodox rabbi of the Beverly Hills Synagogue. I was, I was just at his daughter's wedding a week ago Monday. It's the second child's wedding I've been at in the past year and a half as they have six kids. And uh, so, in fact, it was the trip that I just talked to you about with these pastors. He had met me, Ofer Akunis, one of the members of Knesset, was holding a gathering at the Beverly Hilton and asked me to come. I met the rabbi. Da, 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 da. He heard about the trip, and the rabbi came to me and said, would it be okay? Could I join you on that trip? I'd like to see Israel through a Christian's eyes. So the Orthodox rabbi of Beverly Hills gets on the bus with 30 millennial evangelical pastors. It's like, a, you know, it starts to a joke. And spends four days with us. Spends four days with us. The last night of the trip, we're at the Mount Zion Hotel, and we go down into one of the rooms, we set the chairs up in a circle. And uh, we go around the room and tell what the trip has meant. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being a preacher, I'm not exaggerating in any way. The rabbi sat there and wept. Didn't cry, didn't have some... Wept, sobbed. And this is the Orthodox rabbi of the Beverly Hills Synagogue. And he, formerly of the Saatchi Synagogue of London. He's the former rabbi of the Saatchi Synagogue of London. His father and grandfather were the chief rabbis of Ukraine. 
And he looked at me and he said, I've never, I haven't wept like this since my mother died. He said, if you would have told me that I could feel this much love in a room of Christians, I never would have believed it. Now, seven weeks later, I brought him to Huntsville, Alabama. Have you ever tried finding kosher food in Huntsville, Alabama? I brought him to Huntsville. <laughs> we brought him to Huntsville to speak at our Alabama Celebrates Israel event. And so he comes to Huntsville, Alabama, and he speaks. It was a beautiful event. And we go back to the pastor's office afterward, and we say, we're going to do a little video interview. So we sat down. It was Pastor Rusty Nelson and Rabbi Dunner and myself. And we sat down, and we're talking about the trip, and we're talking about the Celebrate Israel event. We're talking about all this. And Pastor Rusty turned to Rabbi and said, Rabbi, you've been in ministry for many years. You've met pastors before. We've, we've been going to Israel for years. You know, we, we've known of each other's communities. Why is it that all of a sudden right now, it feels like right this, you know, this year, last year, this moment in time, what, what's changing? Why is it that all of a sudden, we're pressing into like deep relationship and we're feeling things that we don't have words for. The rabbi's sitting there in the middle. The rabbi said, he said, this is the rabbi. He said, you know, I don't know. He said, I kind of feel like I've had a veil over my eyes. And I feel like this veil is being removed for the first time and I'm seeing things clearly for the first time in my life. The Holy Spirit is unfolding history one relationship at a time. And Theodore Herzl might not have been the righteous Jew that Heckler thought God would choose in his wisdom. And God's plans might not fit in our theological boxes. But God is moving in situations and ways when the president of such and such a nation calls and says, could you come meet with the imams? You say, yes, Holy Spirit. And you, you flow with the Spirit of God where he's bringing you. The mountain of the Lord is being established. Peace, security, global shalom are not coming from the current power centers of our world. Jerusalem will come to its destiny of being the city of peace as she is established as a city of worship, as she is established as a city of the presence of the Most High King of Heaven. Isaiah said, All nations will stream up. Come, let us walk in the presence of the Lord. So the tabernacle of David is being restored. The mountain of the Lord is being raised as chief among all the nations. And the final thought that I have tonight, and this is not a new one. This, I'm absolutely positive that Harold and Rick and Patty and many others here tonight have preached on this. I'm sure Jody has preached on this. I'm sure we know this. But in my opinion, I would offer to us, we have not walked into it. We've understood it, but we have not walked into it. That's my subjective, correct opinion. <laughs> Malachi chapter 4. See, I will send to you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children unless I come or, let, or else I come and smite the land with a curse. I absolutely am convicted profoundly in my spirit that there is an Elijah outpouring that must happen. And we've prayed for it, we've prophesied it, we've sung about it, we've moved it in part. 
But the Elijah anointing is multifaceted. And sometimes we've focused on certain portions of it to the overlooking of others. We've focused perhaps on Isaac's prophetic war with Jezebel and tearing down that kind of Ahab-Jezebel structure. And certainly that is a major theme of Elijah's life. But just as powerfully was Elijah's ability to raise up young spiritual sons in the school of the prophets so that Elisha would look at him and say, my father, my father, not my teacher, my teacher, not my leader, my, my father, my father. And I have a profound sense that we have not fully unpacked all that God is offering us in the outpouring of the Elijah spirit. I believe that the prophetic move, and I say this lovingly and with great respect, but there's enormous immaturity that we're tolerating in the prophetic move when God is wanting to release some extraordinary influence and authority once again in the, in the prophetic move. We have got to begin to walk in a maturity in the prophetic that includes bearing the responsibility of spiritual sons and daughters. Bearing the responsibility. You know, Elijah's hiding out. And what does he have? He's got, he's got a, you know, he's got a victim complex. And you know, Jezebel's going to get me. And he had to work through his issues. And he had to come to that place to, where God revelatorily said to him, there's more with you than are against you. Or no, he didn't say, he said that too. But that's not what I was thinking of. He said, there's 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee, which was both an encouragement and a rebuke. It was an encouragement to Isaiah, you're not all alone, but it was also a rebuke to, to Elijah, not Isaiah, Elijah saying, I've got this thing under control, Elijah. The prophetic move must come into a place where we are growing in maturity. I fear that we can become addicted to spiritual adrenaline. And we have to have the next shout and the next this and the next that. And, and you've been with me. You know nobody loves all that more than me. I'll dance down all of you. But on the other side of that, there's the hard work of working through our stuff. Of, of what it means to grow in grace and to grow in relationship and to grow in planted relationship in the kingdom of God. And this is what my prayer is for us in this next move of the Holy Spirit. The litmus test still is they will know you are Christians by your love. The litmus test still is what is the quality of love and relationship and life in the community of the redeemed. It's not simply that I'm able to call out your phone number. And I love all that. But everything we know through biblical narrative is that the enemy can counterfeit psychic miracles left and right. But it is only the Spirit of God that can bring deep spiritual maturity and deep kingdom life to us as a people. And so I'm praying in this hour that there would be a marriage together of these three themes that we would come into the place of understanding that it's a tabernacle of David. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is the structure, the order, the place of the kingdom of God, that house of prayer reality. Number two, that this mountain of the Lord is being established in a profound and amazing way and that we would see it. And I would submit to my brothers and sisters, I 
I, I, be, I am convicted that, and, and Rick and Patty and Harold, and, but I mean, I'm convicted that in the near, it would not surprise me that if in the not so distant future, the Lord would begin calling for us to walk out prophetic acts on the Temple Mount in growing and increasing ways. And I understand that that is controversial. I understand that that has calculated risks. And I understand all of those realities. And it's very unusual for me to be vocalizing that. I'm Cindy Jacobs can tackle that one. I'm not going to go there, right? You know, I mean, that to me is like, wow, I'm not going to. But I'm increasingly this year feeling that there is something about the people of God placing their feet and walking and declaring the kingdom of God in that epicenter. And I submit that to the body. And then third, that the Elijah anointing, I believe we've walked in it to our ankles or maybe our knees in this Elijah spirit, this Elijah revelation. But I believe the Holy Spirit is calling us to a much deeper, more profound, and more mature um, expression of that prophetic spirit that comes before the day of the Lord approaches. It's a blessing to be with you tonight. The Lord bless you. Well, thank you so much, Robert for sharing these very, very deep and substantial insights into the Word of God as well as into the signs of the time, the prophetic, the kairos. And I would like to build a bridge and let us pray into the door you've opened up for us. See, from my perspective with Global Prayer Call, it's about Israel... It's about the nations, but number three, it's about the remnant. And you taught us about the remnant, our attitude, our perspective, our horizon. Yeah. So let's take this opportunity with what you've offered to us to pray for the priestly, prophetic, for the apostolic, prophetic remnant in the nations. No, it's the ten righteous. It's the seven thousand. It's the three hundred. It's that kind of a remnant that the Lord is preparing for this hour in such a time as this. And we are in the middle of it. We are part of it. Even our most painful experiences are because of that. Because the Lord is preparing a remnant. And so I think you set an, out an agenda for the end time remnant that is called not only to bless Israel, that's number one, but that's called to stand in the gap for our nations in such a time as this. Because the nations are moving towards a valley of decision. But it's not clear yet how many nations will end on this side, how many nations will end on the other side. And it's up to the remnant to be available to the God of Israel, the God of history, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to make a difference for our nations. For Israel, the promises are clear, but for your nation and for my nation, there's much in the balance. And so I would like to invite us now and ask you both and whoever is, Patricia and whoever is feeling, you know, drawn to, to lead us into prayer for the end time remnant, the priestly prophetic and the apostolic prophetic remnant, especially in your nations.